All right. Listen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Have you ever heard that on the radio or have seen that anywhere besides in this class? Okay, it's, it's, it's one of the old, old sayings of ancient sayings of the church and it's just wonderful, isn't it? Jerry, did you have a, something? Oh, a, where's Dersel? Okay, Aaliyah. All right, our ice cream social is not next week, but the next. This is my granddaughter, Aaliyah. Tell her hi. 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 Isn't she beautiful? She got all those looks from me. And um, she's passing out the ice cream social sign-up sheet. We're going to have it at the Wootens, and so sign up for that. All right. Now let's look at the newsletter, please, because it has, it has the outline of where we're going in this class in the next few weeks with the book of Daniel. Uh, we're looking at studying Daniel 8. Now I want you to be thinking as we're studying Daniel 8 because we're going to look at some really historical characters, some real people, funny uh, kind of outlandish people, kings. And I want you to think about why it is that we're studying Daniel 8. We just finished the middle of Daniel 19, the Battle of Armageddon. And I said, now, this is where world history as we know it will stop, at the Battle of Armageddon. So I wanted to go back into Daniel and to share with you how Daniel fits with all of the book of Revelation. So in Daniel 8, we are looking at four people who cross the stage of prophecy as well as history. And last week we, we looked at Daniel the prophet and what he, where he was when he received this vision of Daniel 8. Today we're looking at Cyrus the Great of Persia and um, Crystal. Crystal, will, will you tell everybody what you learned today and, and when you were looking at your son's homework and his uh, uh, textbooks? She homeschools her son. Real loud, baby. We were doing world history, and uh, just coming through the book, I saw that it uh, had Cyrus's cylinder in there, talking about things we're talking about in our class. Good for you. She was going through her son's history book and saw uh, Cyrus's cylinder. Brenda, didn't you all hear about that also on that TV show that you like, the, the, um, the game show? Oh, yeah. What was his name? Jeopardy. Jeopardy. Jeopardy has Cyrus on there quite often, don't they? All right. So we're going to learn about that today so that you can answer the questions on Jeopardy. We'll be looking at Alexander the Great of Greece, and we'll be studying Antiochus IV Epiphanes. If you want to know what the Antichrist is going to be like, we will study him in Daniel 8. Antiochus IV Epiphanes is the picture of the Antichrist to come. So today we're looking at Persia and, um, and at the Ram. So we're pages 280 to 281. Now, I don't know if you can see this picture. Aaron, why don't you, and uh, who's in the back? Put, uh, turn off the light back there, Aaron. I want you to just see this picture, kind of. Because in Daniel 8, Daniel sees two beasts. He sees a ram with two horns, and that's what we're studying today, and a goat with one long protruding horn. What have I taught you in prophecy that a beast or beasts represent? Not nations. Empires. Empires are made of many nations that have been conquered by, by a monarch. So it's a, the, the uh, at beast represent empires. What do the horns represent on these beasts? Nations. nations, that's right. And so the horns represent kings and or nations. So today we're looking at uh, Daniel 8, verses 1 and 2 from last week. Thank you. Lights, please. Uh, this is, we're, I'm just giving you the context of Daniel 8. 
and we've been learning from Kayleen in how to study the Bible, how important context is in studying the scriptures, when and where and who and what happened and perhaps why. Well, Daniel gives us the context of his vision. This is chapter 8, 1 and 2. It's up here on the board. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, we learned last week that we know the year of Belshazzar's reign. It was 551 B.C. I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. What vision if he's in Daniel 8 and he gave us, is telling us about this vision and one had already appeared, which vision would that have been? Daniel 7, the beasts, the four beasts coming up out of the sea. So this is a vision after that one. In my vision, now he tells us where he is and he tells us three places or three, uh, I, three statements about where he is and we studied these last week so you will have a map in your notes from last week uh, Will did you get did you get your papers yeah. with Alex. I mean Alec, Alec why do I do that <laughs> well that's it it's your middle name <laughs> Alexander William and I'm calling him Will all day Alec you got your papers all right, last week I gave you a map, and he said, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa. I, it was in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Uli Canal. So Daniel tells us when he saw this vision and where God transported him to. When he had this vision, he was in Babylon. God has transported him to Persia. They have uh, looked at the, where the Uli Canal probably was because it was from the Tigris River into the city of Susa. And they have found in, in, in uh, way up high in our satellites taking pictures of that and they, they saw the incline of the earth where that canal used to be. Isn't that cool? So, why do you think Daniel thought it important to give us these details. Why is it important that we know when and where he was? Because it's always important to have context. Because here's what Daniel wants us to know. He was in Babylon, but he was transported in his vision to the future, to Persia, to the citadel of Susa. When he had this vision, there was no fortified city called Susa. Isn't that fun to know? All right. Now, verses 1, I mean verses 3 and 4, and we are on number 1, page 280, right? Okay, let me find it. Number 1, the first beast. Uh, Daniel said, I looked up. He's standing on a canal, and you see the water. I looked up, and there before me was a what? A ram. So we know it represents an empire. And that's the Persian Empire. It had two horns. We know that the two horns represent which two nations in this empire? Media and Persia. And I was standing beside the Uli Canal. And the horns were long. Long horns represent great power. All right, that's number one. Now, if you'll look at that, it makes no sense. The blanks make no sense. So just mark them out or put in the Medes and the Persians. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns, representing Media and Persia. I don't know why the blanks look like that. All right, everybody with me on that? One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. Which horn, which nation at the beginning of this empire was smaller? Persia or Media? Media. Persia. Persia. But eventually, Persia became the stronger nation. So that was the longer horn. That's what those horns represent. Verse 4. Now let's look at how this empire, what this empire did. I watched the ram or Persia, as it charged toward the west. 
Now, if you look at your map on last week's lesson, just go back and look at your lesson on page 279, I think. You'll see the map. I watched it as it charged toward the west and the north and the south. On your map, which nation would be west? Babylon. Babylon. Which nation would be north? Lydia. Lydia which is Turkey today, and which nation would be south? Egypt. Egypt. All right? No animal, no nation, or even an empire could stand against Persia or against the ram. And none could be rescued from its power. What is this telling us about this ram, the empire of Persia? <laughs> What's it telling us? Powerful. Powerful. Took over every nation that it came in contact with. Okay. So it, the empire, the Persian Empire, did as it pleased and became great. That's letter uh, A, number one, on page 280. All right. Now let's look at number two. Is everybody with me on this? Are we on page 280? 280, number two is where we're at. All right, let's look at letter A, number one. It's the vision. Got it? He looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns. Those two horns represented Persia and Media. So my blanks don't work. Standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns, which was what? Persia. Persia was longer than the other. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against it and none could rescue from its power. It did as it pleased and became great. Now then, verse 20, Daniel receives the interpretation of this ram. The interpretation all the way down in your Bible to verse 20. And this is what Gabriel, uh, is it Gabriel? told him. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media. And Daniel 6 tells us who the king of Media was at this time. Darius. Of Daniel 6. That king is the one who put Daniel in the lion's den. And the other horn represents Persia, or who's the king? Cyrus. Cyrus the Great. So the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media. What's his name? Darius, Darius or Darius. And Persia, Cyrus the Great. We read about these kings in chapter 6 of Daniel. Darius is the one who put Daniel in the lion's den. And Cyrus the Great is mentioned 30 times in the Bible. We're going to look at some of those places. That's number letter A, number 2, the interpretation. Now would you just open your Bible to Daniel 5? Because Daniel is in Babylon... All of the Jews are in Babylon as slaves. And he knows that Babylon is going to eventually, or at least the Jews are going to be going back home, back to Judah. In how many years? 70, 70 years. He knows that. So he doesn't know what's going to happen to Persia until we get to Daniel 5. Are you there? Yep. All right. Daniel 5 is the account of the fall of Babylon. So I want you to really read that because now you understand it. Da Babylon fell. It was conquered, defeated by whom? What nation? What, ki what empire? Am I, am, I, am I making a mistake? We all, are you okay? Babylon fell to Persia. You'll read about that in Daniel 5. And that's the, the writing on the wall. So look over at page, verse 26 
of chapter 5. Daniel is interpreting the writing on the wall to King Belshazzar. And he said, this is what those words mean. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Right there is where it tells us about the fall of Babylon. Now, Daniel 5, Daniel was living in Babylon when he received this vision. He was an eyewitness to the fall of Babylon. Wouldn't that be amazing? Mm -hmm. He knew it was going to happen. And he knew that it was going to fall to a king named Cyrus. I'm going to show you that. So that's number three in your notes. Okay, I'm looking, people looking confused at me. Daniel, Go ahead. Daniel 5, 30 says it was actually Darius of the Medes. Daniel 5, verse 30. Yes, but it says in verse 28, it will get, be given to the Medes and the Persians. Right, His, but at that time the Medes were stronger than the Persians because the Persians had not. Well, no, the Medes had already been conquered by Persia. But right there in verse 30, it does say Darius. Yeah, Right. Okay. Darius the Mede took over Babylon. Yes. Okay. But the whole P Persian Empire was divided in many, many provinces. Babylon became one of those provinces and Darius was appointed as the governor or the king over, over Babylon. All right. Number four. This is the map. These kings were coming from the east. Which, where is that? In the, map, in the Bible history from Persia. They charged toward Babylon in the west. This is number what on your notes? Four. Okay, number four. All right. And then they, cha they charged toward Lydia, which is the north, way up there in Turkey. And then toward Egypt, the south. Look how huge this empire is all the way from the Indus River in India all the way through the Middle East through Turkey through Babylon Israel and Egypt a huge empire in fact it was the greatest empire the world had ever known and that's number four anybody need help with that one Right here. Okay. <laughs> okay. The ram, uh, it, char from the, it came from the east, charged toward the west, Babylon, and the north, which is Lydia, and the south, which is Egypt. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. This should remind us of the bear in chapter 7, which was also Persia, represented Persia. What did that bear have in its mouth? Three ribs. Three ribs. And, the, and we say that it represents Lit Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt, those three ribs. So it should remind us of the beast in chapter 7 that had three ribs in its mouth. Look at letter B. Nothing could stop the ram. No army could stop the rampage of Persia. I used the word rampage when I talked about the ram. Okay? Nothing could stop its rampage. And that's letter A and B of number four. Now let's just review on number five real quick. This ram, what did it represent? The Medo-Persian oh, the Medo Empire. What do its two horns represent? King Darius of Media and what of Persia? King Cyrus of Persia. That's right. And that's number five. Now let's look at letter A on number five. Just done, we've just done this. The Persian Empire extended east to the Indus River in India, west to Lydia, and south to Egypt. 
In fact, by 525 BC, when Cyrus's son Cambyses conquered Egypt, it had become uh, the largest empire the world had ever seen. And that's number five, A and B. Questions? To the country of Egypt? All right. Now let's look at Cyrus the Great of Persia. This is one of those kings that was the most important kings in the Bible to Israel. He was a pagan king of a pagan nation. But yet God used this king to, to uh, accomplish his purposes for his people, the Jews. He used a pagan king. And he can still do that today. So let's see what Cyrus the Great of Persia was like. Now, can I have the lights off? This is kind of interesting. This is on one of, this is a carving on one of his palaces in one of his capital cities. The uh, Persians had at least four, maybe three, capital cities. And uh, this is one of the carvings or a relief on one of his palaces that they had found in Persepolis. And you can't really see it. So I want you to go into, you, maybe you can see it on your picture on your uh, page here, but um, his horn, his, his crown, the base of it are ram's horns, which I think is so fascinating because it just parallels the prophecy of Daniel. So this is a, this is a, a carving of him, an image of Cyrus the Great. Oh, it's in Pesagarde. I said Preser. Persepolis, but it's Pesargarde on one of his palaces. He is wearing a crown of ram's horns, and it's very difficult to see on the pictures, but see if you can find that in, some, in your notes at home. Daniel knew the scriptures. Okay, let's, lights please. Daniel knew the scriptures of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Now I want to just point out something. When he was a little boy, about 14 years old. How old are you, Logan? 13. Logan, stand up. This is a 13-year-old boy. Anybody else in here 14? Good. When Logan is one more year old at 14, that's how old Daniel was when he was taken from his parents and taken as a slave to Babylon. Can you, does that break your heart? Come here, Logan. This is a little boy whose parents adored him. Adore him. His grandparents adore him. And he was taken as a slave to the pagan country of Babylon. And there the king took him and brainwashed him. But really he didn't. But he taught him the language of this pagan country taught him the religion of this pagan country, taught him about the gods, the culture of this country. How did his parents feel? How do you think his parents felt? Sad. Devastated, weren't they? Thank you, that's not going to happen to you. Oh dear, I didn't do that to a big boy, I'm sorry. <laughs> and when he got... But his heavenly father had him protected all the way. You love that part of the story, don't you, Dorothy? His heavenly father did have him protected. When he got to Babylon, the king and all of the, all of the palace people tried to make Daniel a pagan. They worked hard to brainwash him, to make him worship the gods and practice the occult rites of a pagan culture. Daniel refused. How is it that a 14-year-old boy could go to a country like that and maintain his, his faithfulness and his truthfulness 
to God in that culture. How could he do that? Because his parents taught him the scriptures. Do you hear me? It was not the temple priest who his parents thought would teach him the scriptures. They were wicked. The church at that time, the temple, was totally anti-God, totally pagan. It was his parents. Listen, parents, it's the parents who are responsible for the spiritual instruction of their children. You do not leave it to anybody. Just because your kids might be in youth group does not mean they're going to learn the Bible. We must pay attention to how Daniel was raised. Because in the face of every, every pagan god, he stood faithful to God. He knew the scriptures. He knew the book of Isaiah. How could he know the book of Isaiah? Because his parents taught him. And he also knew the book of Jeremiah. How could he know the book of Jeremiah? Well, it wasn't written when he was 14 years old, by the way. It wasn't written yet. Jeremiah was in Jerusalem when Daniel was taken captive to Babylon. And do you know what Jeremiah did? This is so important. In chapter 29 of Jeremiah, look at that book. Look at Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the captives and the exiles in Babylon. Do you hear me? He wrote them a letter. And it went four, uh, like a, how many miles was it? Anyway, it's a 40-day journey from Jerusalem to Babylon. And that letter had to go all across the desert and follow the rivers to Babylon. And he wrote them a letter. So in Jeremiah, look back from Daniel to Jeremiah. And I want you to see some of the words that Jeremiah wrote to the people in Babylon. They were slaves. Do you know what a slave is, Marley? What did he say, Nathan? Somebody owned them. Yes, and the Babylonians owned these people. I want to read to you what Daniel knew about the letter from Jeremiah. In fact, probably, probably, we can think about this, that Jeremiah put it into the hands of Daniel. And he said, you take care of this. This is from God. Let's see what he said. <clears throat> Whoops, it's not there. I'm gonna have to, I'll go back to that one. Go to... I'll just read it to you right now. Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 1. Ready? This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile. Did you know that Jeremiah had written them a letter? Now look at verse 10. This is what the Lord says. Now Daniel remembers reading this. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. Well, listen, uh, 70 years are completed for Babylon. That's implying that when Babylon falls, I'm going to come get you and bring you home. That's what God is promising them. Look at verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Who is, are these words written to? The exiles in Babylon. Don't you know how they felt when they received this? How many of you use this verse for your children? All of us do, don't we? How many of you use this verse for yourself? God has plans for you. And then look what he says. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. He's writing this to exiles in Babylon. Plans to give you what? Hope and a future. Thank you, God. 
Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. When we use this verse, we can apply it to ourselves, can't we? But we must understand as a spiritual biblical student the context of this verse. It's a verse that God wrote to his people in the worst of times, in the worst of times, in exile. And he said, I'm going to come back and get you. All right. Now I want to read some more verses to you. Daniel knew that. And he also knew Isaiah. What Isaiah said about him. I got ahead of myself, but that's okay because I couldn't wait. He knew the chapters of Isaiah. Turn over to Isaiah. Just turn back. You're in Jeremiah, and then you're going to see Isaiah. Isaiah was written 150 years before this, before Daniel was doing his writing. All right? And you know what he does in chapter 44 and 45? If you've been in this class before, how many of you remember this? Raise your hand if you remember me. I know Martha does and Sue does. How many else remember about Isaiah and Cyrus and Cyrus? Listen. Daniel knew that somebody named Cyrus was going to be coming and was going to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. He knew it because Isaiah had prophesied this. I think this, if, I think this is the most beautiful prophecy maybe in the Bible. Not really. There's many more. But it was so astounding what God did. 150 years before Cyrus was born. Isaiah told of his birth 150 years before told about his birth gave us his name and told us the tasks that God had predetermined for him to accomplish is that not incredible yeah. and you know it's found in the book of Isaiah so let's look at this this is verse 44 Chapter 44, verse 28. And I'm going to read it to you out of the Bible. It is so wonderful because I'm going to skip around. Make sure you're open to your Bible to chapter 44 because we're going to go into a few other chap verses too. But look at verse 28. 44, verse 28. Um, let's see. Here it is. This is when he is saying Jerusalem is going to be inhabited again. Look at me. When this was written... Jerusalem was a powerful city. It was, not, it was not destroyed at all. The temple, it was in its heyday. It was a beautiful, powerful temple, Solomon's temple. The whole world knew about this temple. But now let's see what happens in verse 28. God says of Cyrus, uh, he says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. And let's go back and look at that again at the bottom. It is the Lord who says of Cyrus. He is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. Now, the, when we talk about shepherds, remember I told you that Persia was just a little, little bitty, tiny, significant, insignificant little country. And what they did was raise sheep. Cyrus' grandfather was the king of Persia. And he had a vision or somebody told him that his grandson, who was just about, his daughter was pregnant. And they said, it's going to be a boy and he's going to be a grandson and he's going to grow up and take your throne. What do you think a king thinks about that? Wow. No way. So he finds one of his buds and says, when that baby is born, you take him and kill him. But the man had a wife who wanted a baby. So he took, he was a shepherd. 
This man was a shepherd. And he took this baby home and never told the king. But he took that, shepherd, that baby home to his wife. And she raised him as her own. And he grew up being a shepherd. Is that not cool? Now, here he says, Cyrus is my shepherd. And he is going to accomplish all that I please. Now, before I go on any further, Cyrus is a picture of Jesus Christ. The first picture here is that he is a what? A shepherd. And he is going to accomplish. He told us. Jesus told us, I've come to accomplish my Father's will. Cyrus will be sent to accomplish all that God wants him to do. He will, here Cyrus will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. Now what are the people thinking when they hear this from Isaiah? What? Jerusalem being rebuilt. Jerusalem is a strong city surrounded by huge walls. How, what do you mean it will be rebuilt? It will be rebuilt and of the temple let its foundations be laid. This is telling the people of Israel that someday Jerusalem is going to be conquered to fall and that the temple will be destroyed, right? They refuse to believe that. So that's number 1A. Who says of Cyrus? This is letter B, number 1. He is my what? He will accomplish all that I please. He will say of what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Let it be Build. rebuilt. And of the temple, temple let it be laid. All right. Now, Isaiah's listeners did not know that Judah and Jerusalem, 100 years later, would be taken into exile to Babylon. They didn't know that, did they? They didn't know that Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. They didn't know that. In fact, when Isaiah wrote this prophecy, Jerusalem and the temple were still standing. Isn't that amazing? And that's letter B, number one, letter B. Got it? How do you think his listen, listeners reacted when they heard this prophecy from Isaiah? They were shocked. What? Shocked. Shock? Disbelief? In fact, refusal to believe it? In fact, Jeru Jeremiah kept telling them, Jerusalem is going to fall, the temple is going to be destroyed. And they said in the book of Jeremiah, the people said, no way. No way will that happen. It's God's temple. He would never let his city and his temple be destroyed. But it was. All right, now then, how do you think his listeners responded? We talked about that. That's lesson number one. Now, go to chapter 45 of, of Isaiah. He continues with his prophecy of Cyrus, who had not been born yet. Look at chapter verse 1. I'll tell you what. Go over to page 281. Just turn the page and look at number 3. I'm going to read that right now. Because I want to, want to keep all of Cyrus together here. Are we there? Let's read more of Isaiah's prophecy regarding Cyrus. This is page 281, number 3. Ready? This is what the Lord says to his anointed. Jesus, again, was the anointed of God, wasn't he? And so we have a picture here of Jesus. And he says to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations. Did Cyrus subdue nations? Yes. yes. To strip kings of their armor? Did he do that? Yes. yes. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen, I summon... Now listen, this is God talking to somebody named Cyrus. I summon you by name. What's that name? Cyrus. Cyrus. I bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. Cyrus was not a believer. He did not acknowledge God. Look at the next verse. Verse 5 of chapter 45. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you, Cyrus, though you have not 
acknowledged me. We'll look at that again. Now, so we know that Isaiah, I mean, um, Daniel knew these prophecies of Cyrus from the book of Isaiah. Now listen, he watches Babylon get defeated by a Persian king named what? Cyrus. Cyrus. He knew the prophecy of Cyrus in the book of Isaiah. And he also knew the prophecy of Jeremiah 29. And I just read it to you. When 70 years are completed, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. I know I have the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to what? Prosper you and to not harm you. Plans to give you a what? Hope, Hope and a future. Daniel knew that. And when did Jeremiah write this prophecy? He wrote this to the exiles in Babylon, didn't he? And Daniel read that prophecy. He received that letter. He wrote it, uh, well, he wrote it in, uh, well, he said it'll be 70 years. And in, where'd, I, where'd that? In 605 BC, when Daniel was ex exiled to Babylon, is when he wrote that. Now go to Daniel 9, verse 2. This is a powerful chapter when we read Daniel 9 now. We're going to study Daniel 9, but I want you to read, read, read this to you. Daniel 9, verse 2. I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures... And we know it was Isaiah and Jeremiah. According to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet. That the desolation of Jerusalem would last how long? 70, 70 years. Daniel knew from Jeremiah's writings that the exile in Babylon would last 70 years. And therefore it was soon to end. In fact... From the time Daniel went to Babylon until its defeat by Persia, it was 66 years. Did you hear what I said? From the time Daniel went to Babylon until it was defeated by Persia, it was 66 years. Daniel knew that God had said 70. So he knew it was to soon come to an end. He knew that it would be a man named Cyrus who would rebuild Jerusalem. And now he's met a man named Cyrus. Isn't that cool? So Daniel had been in exile in Babylon for 66 years. And there are the dates, 605 to 539 B.C. Am I doing okay? <laughs> All right. I can't hear you. He read these prophecies to the Babylonians. Yeah. To whom do you think he read these prophecies? Cyrus. To Cyrus. Tradition says he read these prophecies to Cyrus. He was, he was Cyrus' top man. And he read him the prophecies of Jeremiah and the prophecies of Isaiah. And, I, and Cyrus sees his name in prophecy of a Jewish God. I think that's incredible. So he read his prophecies to Cyrus, showing that Cyrus was preordained to accomplish God's purposes for his people. How do you think Cyrus felt when he saw his name in Scripture? <coughs> Be hard to believe, wouldn't it? Be really hard to believe when you see your name written in prophecy 150 years before you were born. How do you think Cyrus responded to these prophecies? Daniel said, this exile is going to last 70 years. It's been 66. You, Cyrus, are going to rebuild Jerusalem and lay the foundations of the temple. What do you think Cyrus did? I'll show you what he did on page 281. Let's look. He issued this decree. On Cyrus's cylinder, he issued a decree that very year. Okay? 
when Daniel read him this stuff, he wrote this decree to allow the Jews to return home to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. And he put it on this cylinder. It's called Cyrus's cylinder. It's about nine inches long and it's written in cuneiform and nobody was, it was found in the eight, uh, I forgot when it was found, but we didn't really learn how to read cuneiform until the late 1800s. So it went, they weren't able to read it until the late 1800s. Uh, it's written in cuneiform on a clay cylinder, nine inches long, four inches in diameter. And if you want to see it, where do you go? You go to the London British Museum. The London British, the British Museum in London. Yeah. And my husband, I told you, took me there. What, darling? <laughs> second floor in the back. I thought for sure it would be right in the very front door, but it wasn't. It was the Rosetta Stone that was in the very front door. We'll study Rosetta Stone in a few weeks. All right. It's considered the first example of human rights. Isn't that not amazing? No, nowhere else has it ever been put in writing and legislation that a country can have freedom of religion, but it did. His decree allowed all foreign residents of Babylon to go home, rebuild their temples, and establish their religion. Doesn't matter what, just do it. That's what he told them in this, in this cylinder. Restore their religions, rebuild their temples. And here's what I want to end with this. The Bible records this event of Cyrus's cylinder. Did you know that? It's so exciting to me to read because the Bible records Cyrus writing this cylinder. It's in an Ezra chapter 1. So just turn over to Ezra. And that's right before uh, the Psalms, close to the Psalms. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, and then Psalms. Chapter 1. I'm not going to tell you about Ezra until next week. But look at what it says. No, go, go back one more page to 2 Chronicles. Just flip the page back. One more page. These are the last verses of Chronicles of the Kings. This is what happened when Israel was conquered by Babylon, or Judah. Excuse me, Judah was. Look at verse 15 of chapter 36 of 2 Chronicles. Um, look at verse, I'm sorry, verse 20 of 2 Chronicles 36. Nebuchadnezzar carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword and they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of what? Persia came to power. And look down in verse 22. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, and who else? Daniel. Isaiah. Oh. The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation. What did he write that proclamation on? Cylinder. That cylinder. And he put it throughout his realm, and he put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, the king of Persia, says. The Lord... The God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He knew who gave him his power, didn't he? Isn't that interesting? The Lord, the God of heaven, has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. He understood the God of Judah, didn't he? Any one of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem. Look at Ezra, the very next page. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. On a what? This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven. This is the same verse, isn't it? The God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, 
the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. Listen. God uses, this is number... Number th okay. Number three, letter B. Way down at the bottom. God uses pagan nations and pagan kings to accomplish his will for his people. Now I kind of jumped around on this lesson and I've worked so hard on it and it still didn't fit. But here's what I want you to know. 150 years before King Cyrus of Persia was born, God appointed him to accomplish his purposes for his people. Was he a believer? No. He was not. He did not acknowledge God, but God used him for his people. Now look at number three at the very bottom of page 281. Did Daniel know of Cyrus's decree? Yes, he did. Because he was right there in the palace. Did he know that Zerubbabel led a whole group of people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple? Was he aware of that first return? Yes, it was the very same year that Babylon fell. And it was the very same year that Cyrus wrote his proclamation. All in 539 B.C. Isn't that exciting? Daniel saw the fulfillment of God's prophecies. Um, he lived, letter A, he lived at least until the third year of Cyrus's reign. How do I know that? Chapter 10, verse 1 tells us. He was in the first group of exiles to be taken to Babylon in 605 B.C. He was in the first group when he was 14 years old. You always think of Logan and Marley. And 66 years later, he witnessed the first group of exiles to return home to Jerusalem. Don't you think God honored his faithfulness to the scriptures? Yes. God honored him. God honored his parents when they taught him the scriptures when he was just a little boy. So here's what I want you to think about. Let her see at the very bottom. How many prophecies did Daniel see fulfilled? You'll have to think about it. But he saw all the prophecies of Isaiah regarding Cyrus fulfilled, didn't he? He saw the fall of Babylon. He saw the return of the people of Israel back home. It's beautiful because he was a faithful, faithful witness to God. Anybody want to comment on...